Sure. Okay. So please, yeah, mm -hmm. you give us your name and a little mm -hmm. bit of. Uh, how you ended up in, in this seat today. <laughs> I'm Audrey Tong, Taiwan's Digital Minister in charge of social innovation. Ten years ago, I was part of G0 v Gov0, a civic tech movement that take all the government websites and imagine new ways to do it, to fork the government. So I guess nowadays, for the past six years, we're now merging back into the government. And what does it, like, what, where does it come from, this... Uh, uh, the, the activism that you did, how did you become interested or involved in um, uh, digital movements and activism? Yeah, uh, when, I, when I was a child, um, my parents both worked in journalism uh, as investigative journalists. And I always think that if people see that there are better alternatives uh, that are available for people to experience, then it inspires people to take action. Um, and so when, for example, the parliament here in Taiwan was occupied peacefully uh, in March 2014, uh, my work, uh, along with other people in the Gov Zero initiatives, is exactly to show people that it is possible to occupy in a way that's not just nonviolent, but also constructive, that half a million people on the street and many more online can imagine a better future and have a wide deliberation with everyone, either on the street or online. And what happened during this particular movement? First, can you get, can you tell us where you were and how you? Uh, it was the first time for a lot of people, and especially in your generation, um, that uh, uh, people would take the streets and you know protest in such a way. How did that did that make you feel? You and the people around you, and uh, you know, like some kind of like personal feeling about that movement. Yeah, um, I feel very much curious how much of this free software, open source ethics that I've been advocating and living really uh, since the mid 90s could work at scale. Because on say Wikipedia, uh, OpenStreetMap uh, or other internet communities, of course people can be open to strangers because you cannot really punch anyone across the screen, right? Uh, so there are certain ways to do uh, constructive um, co-creation in a way that doesn't harm e everyone and it welcomes strangers. But it is quite different with half a million people on the street. Mm -hmm. There's this real danger of people believing in conspiracy theories or rumors that escalates to violence as we have seen other occupies around the world. Mm -hmm. Prior to 2014, I was very interested in Manuel Castell's uh, theories and observations of Occupy movements around the world. I also helped translating uh, part of his book about this phenomena. So I was quite aware both of, of the dangers, there's a certain trepidation of the escalation to violence, but also uh, I feel curious that what if uh, the nonviolent communication, the open space technology, the dynamic facilitation methods that we learned from our open source and free software communities can be applied on the street. Uh, yeah, it's, it's good, the sound, but just mm. sometimes it's making a little bit noise. Really? Yeah, a little bit. So it's still doing that. Uh, huh? Do you want some more uh, tape to stick it again? Maybe yeah, sure, sure, sure. Stick. Yeah. Why not? I think just make it thicker, like more room between the okay. So I the mic the and the clothes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna put yes. When in doubt. This much? Yes. Apply more tape. And okay. Yes, that's good. Thank okay. you. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Does it show? Like, is it okay? Shows a little bit. Yeah. It shows a little bit. Okay. Yes, because you don't need to have a good position. Yeah. 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 But 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 it doesn't ruffle anymore, right? No, it doesn't ruffle. Okay. Just that in the picture, it's seen a bit. Uh -huh. That's what you're saying. Okay. You yeah, just spread it out. Yeah. I think let yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's good that I wore black because otherwise it wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and can you explain to our audience that is not so familiar with the sunflower movement? Mm -hmm. What was the justification for mm -hmm. half a million people in the street? Certainly. So back in March 2014, the parliament at the time was trying to rush through a trade deal with Beijing. Uh, and at the time, it was said that constitutionally, it's not a international treaty, and so it doesn't go through uh, the same process as would, for example, in signing something with France or New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, but because of that, people were very worried that the parliamentarians were not giving uh, the public a chance to deliberate substantially, and instead just uh, rush it through as a package. So the rallying cry was really that the MPs were on strike, uh, of sorts, because they refuse to deliberate substantially. Uh, and so the students, uh, mostly undergrad level, are occupying the parliament, taking the MP's place, doing what MP should have been doing, which is deliberating everything uh, piece by piece. Uh, and so they were supported by more than 20 NGOs around the occupied parliament streets, each deliberating on a single aspect of the CSSTA, the trade deal was baiting. And what were you involved uh, as at the moment, what was your implication? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at the time during the Sunflower Movement, there were three kind of neutrals. Uh, one is the pro bono lawyers, uh, they are to protect the due process. Uh, there is also the uh, clinicians and nurses, doctors, uh, they are to protect everyone's health. And we're kind of the communication crew to make sure that even deep within the occupied parliament, uh, where there's no fiber optic lines and so on, uh, there's still uh, broadband for everyone, so that people on the street can make sure that the occupiers are doing peaceful things and they are not threatened by the police. Were you yourself mm -hmm. um, at the uh, legislative union at, the, at that particular moment? So I was there in the legislative union uh, for a few hours because I brought more than 300 meters of ethernet cables uh, wiring the Occupy Legislative Union yeah, so that um, regardless of the live streaming platform's connectivity, uh, we can directly uh, play what's really happening within the Occupy Parliament to the people on the street, allowing for direct conversations. And this is the beginning of the idea of humor over rumor, because if you um, can enjoy uh, co-presence, being together, even though that uh, actually there's walls, right, in the legislature, but through live streaming, people can feel that they are there uh, and they can effect real change uh, through telepresence. Uh, and that um, made sure that people pay sufficient attention so that escalation to violence or rumors or conspiracy theories uh, do not have a way to travel. So that was our contribution as the GovZero community uh, in the cable and power and radio communications for the occupiers. And was it, would you say that it was the base of the foundation of, uh, of uh, when you, when, when you talk about radical transparency, mm -hmm. was it the foundation of, of this principle of radical transparency? Mm -hmm. um, as for radical transparency, uh, rough consensus, running code, and so on, um, these are the uh, foundation of the internet. The internet society, uh, the community that formed the internet, uh, derives their legitimacy, uh, their right to exist, uh, by being radically transparent. Anyone with an email account since the very beginning of the internet can participate in the rulemaking or the request for comment process for the internet. And the same ethos has been carried into the free software community, the open source community, open access community, and so on. So in a sense, radical transparency around the legislature, which was occupied in 2014, was just a, a new manifestation of the same idea that if you are radically transparent to everyone, then strangers would behave in a pro-social way. They would not behave in an anti-social way if everybody can see what's going on. And would you say, uh, to what extent do you think that the Sunfire Movement uh, embodied a turning point in uh, uh, the Taiwanese society and maybe the way that things are governed here? I think the Sunflower Movement really changed how young people look at politics. Back in 2014, before the Sunflower Movement, 
if you ask a random young person on the street, they would say they don't care about politics. Uh, the trust level to the administration was really low, but uh, people do not want to take the right action uh, either, right? So the point here is that the Sunflower Movement made it possible for people to see, like through this collective peak experience, people of very different ideas, those 20 NGOs actually belong to like 20 different ideological camps, uh, can actually work together, effect real change, uh, and derive innovations that are based on those common consensus that people agreed on the street facing the Beijing trade deal request and so on. So the same principle has later on then been applied to many, many other parts of our political processes, leading, for example, to marriage equality and many other social uh, breakthroughs uh, that was formed on the backbone of this newfound willingness for young people to re-engage into political action. And um, would you say that yourself, you could be also the embodiment of the Sanfara movement, the fact that uh, uh, your uh, position has been created in this government? What would you, uh, what, what can you say about this? Right after the Sunflower movement, um, it was very clear in the mayoral election that came later that year, that every mayor candidate, regardless of their party affiliation, has to support open government, radical transparency, civic participation, because the mayors that didn't support these Occupy ethos simply lost the election. And the mayors that do, regardless of their parties, sometimes uh, didn't prepare in inauguration speech, uh, but they got elected anyway. Uh, so the wind of politics has changed. Uh, and so the cabinet reshuffled around the end of the year, and the new cabinet uh, said very explicitly that we want crowdsourcing, open data, this whole civic participation thing, mm -hmm. uh, to be the national strategy going forward. And so uh, starting there, there become a kind of national cabinet level dedicated um, space for civic participation. And for a good reason, because people generally understood that if there's no online forum, for everyone to participate and talk and make sure that they can effect real change, then people are probably going back to Occupy anyway. <laughs> so it is actually a safer space uh, compared to the uh, parliament uh, for direct action and deliberation. And so at that time, they looked at the facilitators, the civic technologists that supported Occupy and invited us in as reverse mentors to the cabinet. So I was also here at this very office, but not as a minister as the young reverse mentor of the minister back then, Jacqueline Tsai. And um, what kind of knowledge did you bring from your uh, own personal experience? Uh, uh, is it, I mean, um, it's very unusual for a government to have someone with your own background in, in within the cabinet. So um, what kind of uh, expertise did you bring and uh, uh, what, can, if you can also explain a little bit what you're what you've been trying to promote throughout the fact that you will probably work with different ministers mm -hmm. or ministries and you know in different mm -hmm. fields. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. So uh, at the moment, I'm a minister with a portfolio or at large minister. There is always eight or nine at large ministers in the cabinet in addition to the 32, 33 vertical ministers with their own ministries. And so this cross-ministerial minister, um, I think works very well, especially for emerging topics, such as digital or open government or youth engagement, because an at-large minister can coordinate not just inter-agency or cross-ministerial meetings, but also with the private sector, with the social sector, and so on. So we're like the interfaces to the public. And now uh, I'm not the first uh, minister at large uh, working with such themes. It's actually a kind of a, a norm here in Taiwan. Like before me, as I mentioned, Jacqueline Tsai, previously at IBM Asia. Uh, before her, uh, Simon Zhang, previously at Google Asia, uh, and so on. So there's kind of always a minister at large or two uh, that serves as an interface with the digital crowd. Mm -hmm. um and to finish with the Sunflower Movement, do you think that uh, in a way, I mean, it brought change to the Taiwanese society and, and it certainly brought 
uh, President Eisenhower two, two hours later, two years later. Um, what did he say to people who also say that um, the rise of tensions with China also come from that point uh, that uh, maybe people in Beijing had the feeling that Taiwan was steering away from their, maybe I can say authority, and I'm not sure that's the, the correct word to use. Sphere of influence. Sphere of influence mm -hmm. is exactly what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. So what do you respond to, that, to these positions? The Sunflower Movement was centered on the idea that any trade deal with Beijing must be treated as an international process, not a domestic process. Of course, we understand this position is not exactly the same as the Beijing position vis-à-vis -vis Taiwan, so that does create tension. But if you ask the 20 NGOs, they uh, focus on very practical matters sometimes. For example, one particular uh, side of the occupied parliament talks about the emerging threat that the Beijing so-called private sector has on our 4G infrastructure back then. Because at the time, we're switching to 4G LTE, and a lot of the um, Beijing jurisdictions uh, vendors uh, are really entering the market with a very, very low price. Uh, and so people were saying, oh, this is just a, a market function and we should just evaluate on cost and so on. On the other hand, the occupiers pointed out that at any given time in the Beijing regime, there's no such thing as a pure private sector. If their state forces them to install back doors or install Trojan horses and so on, uh, then maybe on the next release, the next patch release, then uh, there will be backdoor introduced and we'll have to spend a lot of time, a lot of energy to ensure that each and every upgrade of the firmware, of the equipment and so on are free of such state interferences. And that highlighted a fundamental difference between the liberal democratic countries and authoritarian countries in that, for example, if we use Nokia or use other um, infrastructures from other democratic countries, uh, there is far less chance for the state to meddle in this way because their journalists will probably <laughs> uncover that even before we do, right? Uh, and so uh, the systemic risk uh, evaluation uh, principle was introduced back then during the Occupy. And so I would say that these matters are uh, quite practical. They are not ideological, like unification or independence things, but rather just the fact that it is a authoritarian and opaque regime creates market conditions that are not fair, and people want to make sure that everyone here in Taiwan have a whole of society conversation about these uh, realizations, these understandings. I'd like to move on to uh, Dom Zero and yeah. um, so after. Sure. After a short break. <laughs> yeah. If you want to have a. No, no, it's fine. But, but I, I want to check with you. So, um, in, in your last question, yeah. um, you, you, do, you, do you actually want me to, to say something geopolitical? I mean, instead of just add the sunflower? I mean, I was going to ask again, but more in the second part. Mm -hmm. The fact that um, for me, Gulf Zero, I mean, I want to ask a little bit more about this culture of uh, hacktivism uh -huh. and, uh, and you know, the fact that you, you come from that particular world. Mm -hmm. And because it's going to help me transition to what you feel the Taiwanese model actually is. And then I, I was curious to ask you a few questions about um, how do you see this model, when you, in comparison to the, Ch the yeah. Chinese model, in a way, yeah. but, but the fact that here, mm -hmm. you know, everything is very transparent, yeah, and it seems that every like the new, new technologies are used mm -hmm. to that effect, but at the same time, it creates the more it, this is emphasized, the more it creates a, a gap with what's happening across the street, in a way. Yeah, but uh, I, I want to somewhat challenge that uh, okay, frame please. because because back in twenty fourteen or twenty ten, mm -hmm. uh, the PRC region also wasn't. Uh, as opaque as it is now. Mm -hmm. There was some sort of journalism back then, mm -hmm. right? But nowadays, I, I'm not sure how much journalism is left. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a sense, they're also steering away, like moving very quickly to the opposite <laughs> direction. Uh, I, I want to stress that because um, 
I'll probably be talking about how Taiwan placed the first in Asia, the eighth in the world mm -hmm. uh, on the scale of democracy, according to the Economist. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to portray this image that we accelerated so much on the democracy. Uh, the real fact is that during the two years of pandemic, everybody backslided, <laughs> and just by remaining e equally democratic, we became number one. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the same applies to the PRC. Uh, it looks like the, the gap is very wide now, mm -hmm. but maybe it's not, not that much because we progressed a lot. Maybe it's because they backslided quite a bit, right? <laughs> that, that, that was the frame I was trying to introduce. Right, okay, yeah. interesting. I think it's a fair, like, it's, it's an interesting uh, uh, position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe just start with the, the, the Taiwanese model and, and uh, uh, the fact that uh, it, 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 as you were saying, it plays a little bit this role of being uh, uh, the, 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 the champion of democracy. Okay. And uh, um, how would you define the, the Taiwanese model today? Mm -hmm. um, what are the core values mm -hmm. that you feel are represent, representing this uh, particular model? Mm -hmm. and, um, and how have you seen this model sort of come, come of age? Okay. I think the Taiwan model has always been about collaborating across diversity. It's about democracy, not just as voting every four years or f uh, two years, but rather continuously, so that everybody feel the democracy is an ongoing process. It's like a social technology that everybody can improve just like any other sort of technology that we practice, and it goes better with time. So it's about looking at democracy as a living, organic thing that everybody, regardless of their ideas or their cultures and so on, can equally contribute. So I think that's the Taiwan model. And that's what enabled us to, for example, counter the disinformation crisis uh, without administrative takedowns. It's what allowed us to counter the pandemic without a single day of lockdowns in the past two and a half years and so on. And so all this, I think, proved that diversity really is a strength and not necessarily uh, the kind of polarization, escalation, violence that uh, seems to occupy many people's mind in the West uh, nowadays, that if they think about diversity or diversity on social media, people think automatically about escalation, about violence and so on. But as our um, experience in Occupy and encountering pandemic and infodemic shown, actually there is a pro-social way to go about these things. And. Um you just mentioned the two years of pandemic uh, uh, here in Taiwan, mm -hmm. basically all over the world, but the fact that the way that it was handled here in Taiwan also helped put Taiwan on the map. Yes. So there's of mm -hmm. course the management from the health ministry, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what can you tell us about the way that that was handled from your point of view? Mm -hmm. The fact that, you know, it, you're talking about transparency and, mm -hmm. and the fact that an open um, mm -hmm. uh, systems of an open source. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, what was so specific in the way that Taiwan handled the COVID pandemic uh, starting in 2020? I think the Taiwan model, when applied to counter pandemic, uh, is based on the fact that we make the state transparent to the people, not the other way around. And the state trusted people, not asking for trust. So this is very empowering, basically saying, that we trust the people closest to the field, closest to the pain, understand things better than we do. So for example, we have a toll-free number 1922 that anyone can call and meet with someone uh, listening with empathy and uh, anyone can suggest directly through this toll-free number whatever new ideas they have on countering pandemic. There's a real discussion going on on the PTT, which is a civil society forum free of advertisers or shareholders that alerted the health ministry on the first day of 2020 so that we start health inspections before pretty much everyone else and so on. So this is the participation from everyone instead of people obeying in a top-down, lockdown, shutdown kind of way. It is people understanding basic epidemiological facts and then acting um, however they feel correct or comfortable and relying on the social norm to innovate as the virus mutates. And how did was, was that put in place? You just mentioned the, 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 the toll-free phone mm -hmm. number. Um, 
Can you give us other examples? I know that mm -hmm. uh, Taiwan was the first, one mm -hmm. of the first countries to think about the QR codes to be mm -hmm. able yes. to So, for example, how do you meet that with mm -hmm. uh, uh, privacy concerns? Uh, can you explain a little bit how this whole platform was based on, on transparency? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I know that even sure. people in France were mm -hmm. at the beginning a little bit wary of where you know that might go because mm -hmm. of, of um, uh, privacy uh, yeah, issues. Sure. So, can you explain mm -hmm. a little bit how Taiwan uh, uh, dealt with that. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned the toll-free number 1922. Uh, in April 2020, for example, a young boy called 1922 saying, you're rationing out mask, which is great. All I got was pink, which is not great. None of the boys in my class wear pink. I don't want to wear pink to school. Give me some blue masks. The very next day, on the daily 2 p.m. press conference, all the medical officers wore pink. Uh, and the minister, Chen Shizhong, even said, oh, Pink Panther is my childhood hero. So suddenly the boy became the most hip boy in the class, for only he has the color that the heroes wear, and the hero's hero, I guess, wear. Uh, and all the fashion brands turn pink for a few weeks. Uh, so this is what I mean by norm building, by making it a meme, that a mask is there for you to express yourself, not to shut yourself up. Uh, it changes the meaning of mask wearing. And so people would wear a mask because they, they like a fashionable rainbow or whatever, leopard um, colors, <laughs> textures, uh, and so on, which uh, very quickly made it uh, a norm to wear a mask all the time. And that uh, helped us to overcome the first few uh, variants uh, in the coronavirus. Now, the same uh, goes for the mask rationing. The GovZero community built uh, a website actually a hundred or so websites uh, built by various other communities that people can just check with their phone and see nearby availability of medical grade masks so people would not queue in vain. And later on, this has been expanded so that people can locate rapid testing kits uh, or book for vaccination uh, in a very easy way. But these are not government inventions. These are civic technologies built by people who care about privacy about the dignity, uh, about the personal rights on the digital realms and so on, and they are open source. So that's by trusting the citizen scientists, the civic tech people, to build essential counter-pandemic infrastructure, we made sure that we trust the people, so more people trust back, I, I guess. Uh, compare that if we just look at um, contact tracing. Many jurisdictions choose to work with Apple or Google uh, to roll out their first wave of exposure notification. Or some other states roll their own technology with in-house developers or contractors that are not from the open source community. And the problem is that both are kind of centralizing decision-making power. All those parameters, all those algorithms are written in a way that's kind of opaque, that people cannot directly modify. Right? So the point here in Taiwan is that our contact tracing system, the 1922 SMS system, was not created by the government. It was again created by GovZero people. And the GovZero people made sure that, for example, when you're scanning a QR code on a local venue, say a convenience store, the convenience store only provides this 15 random digit on the QR code, but also printed so you can also manually text it with a flip phone, uh, but a venue never learns anything about you, not your phone number, not anything. And you text to 1922, which is just a shorthand code for your telecom to uh, remember those 15 digit random codes for uh, 28 days, for four weeks. Again, the telecom provider doesn't give it to any uh, venue owner. So the telecom provider doesn't know what those 15 digit means. So this is federated, multi-party, uh, oblivious um, storage, uh, which is a jargon that says all the participating parties doesn't have the whole picture. It is only the contact tracers. When they have a local outbreak, they can go to the venue, look at the venue code, and then send exposure notification to people who have been to that venue in the past 28 days but those contact tracers must leave a record so that people can do a reverse look up and see exactly who in which municipality have looked at my check-ins and why. And all of this must be deleted after four weeks. And so by using privacy enhancing technologies, we ensure that only 
contact tracers doing their work fully recorded can access those records. And even when, for example, um, the police officers investigating serious crimes, uh, one of them tried to file a search warrant to get the mapping table between the 15 uh, digit and the venue, uh, at the venue side. Uh, it was turned down by a judge. And the judge uh, went whistleblowing, writing a public opinion piece, saying that, well, the Communication uh, Wiretapping Act um, works on SMS, but they must be retained for six months. Uh, but this contact tracing must be deleted after four weeks. Obviously, they're, although they're both SMS, they're not the same thing. So the police officers must not treat these contact tracing SMS as communication because it's not communicating with anyone. Okay. So the CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center, immediately uh, started a consultation and ruled quite quickly that indeed none of this information can be shared with law enforcement. But that was because GovZero designed the 1922 SMS system with each and every SMS have a text as part of the QR code that says this must be used for pandemic control only. Mm. So already uh, more than 2 million venues have printed that text uh, to their front door. And so it very quickly uh, established a social norm that is simply wrong mm. for the criminal investigation to use this because it's an implicit social contract. Now, most of the jurisdictions here in Indo-Pacific across Taiwan, even when they build something that is not uh, Apple and Google exposure notifications, they often, after some internal debate, share with criminal investigators if it's really serious crime, uh, but because that's state government technology. Mm -hmm. But here, because it's civic technology, a very strong norm of privacy-preserving ethos is already established by the time that it just received the search warrant. I'd like to use the this last comments on the COVID uh, management, on COVID management, to move on to the the, the threats that are targeting uh, Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it seems that while everything what you were just saying before was implemented here, at the same time Taiwan became uh, the target of, for example very mm -hmm. harsh disinformation campaigns, mm -hmm. cyber attacks, mm -hmm. uh, and mostly from its neighbor. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about this? Do you think there's a, a cause to consequence type of relationship mm -hmm. between the fact that they were handled it that way and it thus became the target of, of China, online mm -hmm. campaigns, cyber threats? Mm -hmm. Uh, according to VDEM project, uh, Taiwan is the top when it comes to the on the receiving end of this information and uh, information manipulation uh, from overseas, uh, and we see that um, have two um, reasons. One is that I think in Taiwan we very much cherish the freedom of speech, just as we do not impose lockdowns during the pandemic we do not do administrative takedowns. And so whereas in other more authoritarian jurisdictions, uh, the state can just arbitrarily take things down. In Taiwan, we, we almost never do that. And so because that is the case, I think it allowed um, the disinformation and information manipulation actors to find uh, more audience and more channels uh, to do their attack. But the second thing though, is that Taiwan also has one of the most vibrant civic tech communities in the world. So instead of shutting things down, saying that the conspiracy theories, the attacks are getting out of hand, we actually see it as an opportunity to make sure that everybody learns about digital competence, media competence, instead of just uh, literacy. Because literacy is when you're at a receiving end, but competence is when you are a producer of fact checks, a producer of, um, for example, uh, live streaming, the um, counting of the ballots at a mayoral or presidential election, which is a favorite pastime for many YouTubers, <laughs> regardless of their party affiliation, uh, or for young people in middle school or even primary school 
to fact check the three presidential candidates in their debates and platforms. And if they found that someone said something like really wrong, uh, maybe their uh, contribution will appear on national level <laughs> broadcast, right? So uh, we see all sort of different kind of mimetic threats as materials to make sure that people can work with each other to make sure that journalism isn't just a profession, but actually like uh, public health is something that people can understand uh, together and make sense together. And so that we can talk about, for example, the latest virus uh, variant, uh, Omicron and so on, but we can also talk about like what's the trending disinformation of the day uh, and um, make fun of it or with it, and which is what we call humor over rumor. And I believe that just like countering the pandemic without lockdowns, this empowering approach uh, that takes uh, all the citizenry and makes sure that people can uh, participate in countering the pandemic or the infodemic with their own contributions, at the end of the day, builds more antibodies of the mind so that we become more resilient to the new variants of information manipulation. We had the chance to uh, film last week a couple of um, uh, teachers that are mm -hmm. learning how to uh, react mm. when they see, you know, disinformation campaigns influ of having an influence mm -hmm. over their own students. Mm -hmm. um, so we learned a lot about, about mm -hmm. how this is or the, how this can be done. Mm -hmm. You were saying that you were talking yeah. about humor over rumor. Mm -hmm. When it comes to cyber threats, cyber mm -hmm. attacks, given your own background, mm -hmm. uh, how how prepared? Mm -hmm. uh, is Taiwan according to you? How mm -hmm. how strong is the digital community? And here I'm more looking for uh, your under your take on uh, the fact that a lot of the people that are sort of guarding, or safeguarding Taiwan, <coughs> are actually civilians mm -hmm, that are mm -hmm. very much involved in this community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, just as there are civic hackers working in GovZero and related communities to safeguard Taiwan during the pandemic and infodemic. So are the white hat hackers communities, the cybersecurity researchers for good uh, in Taiwan, working in a civilian um, ar arena um, in a very, um, a a let me do this again, because sure. these two sort of hackers aren't really comparable. Okay, mm -hmm. right, okay. Just as there are civic technologists like the GovZero people safeguarding against the pandemic and the infodemic, there are also another sort of technologists, uh, cybersecurity researchers, so-called white hat hackers in Taiwan. The HitCon community and many other communities consistently placed at the very top of international cybersecurity contests, competitions, for example, the DEF CON CTF and so on, uh, were consistently at the top ranks. And so uh, with a very high technological excellence, it takes just a few uh, ways to engage with those civic mm, technologists in the Gov Zero and the HITCOM people in the White Hat community to together look at both the service design and the resilience of our new um, digital services uh, from the government. So consistently, uh, we ask people to do penetration testing, uh, to try out our new services before they are actually rolled out. And they do find new vulnerabilities before it actually gets to production uh, to be met by real demands. We have defense in depth so that uh, when some websites and so on uh, may be subject to cyber attack, they cannot uh, actually cross over to uh, critical infrastructure or to the operational technologies. We also have this idea of joint defense. So uh, if people in the private sector, for example, TSMC or other um, manufacturing and other industries uh, face some sort of cyber attacks, there's a reliable intelligence sharing mechanism so that we can defend uh, those incoming threats uh, in a public-private partnership. So I would say that we're quite uh, ready uh, to build the next level of resilience that involves not just the private sector and public sector actors, but also, as I mentioned, the civic sector, the people who feel that they have real contributions to make uh, to make sure that our cybersecurity infrastructure is ever more secure than before by, well, playing uh, the red team uh, and letting us know our vulnerabilities before the black hats do. Maybe a few last words on 
um, the Taiwan identity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really curious about what it means to you. I have the feeling that when I started researching, um, there's such a thing as a Taiwanese identity, but it depends where you stand and people mm -hmm. define it differently. And I also have the feeling that um, there's more and more an affirmation of this identity. Mm -hmm. In other words, Taiwan is getting a more international platform, uh, international profile. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people are wondering what, what actually makes Taiwan what it is and the mm -hmm. Taiwan is what they are. What is your understanding on this of this and how have you seen an evolution of this perception of feeling mm -hmm. Taiwanese? Mm -hmm. Taiwan is caught between the Eurasian plate on one side and the Philippine Sea plate on the other. The two plates bump into each other all the time. If you're here in Taiwan for a few months, chances are you've experienced an earthquake. It just happens very regularly. But all these earthquakes push the tip of Taiwan, the Savia or the Jade Mountain, Yushan, skyward. So that once we have the resilience in our buildings, infrastructures, and so on. We cannot predict uh, when the next earthquake will hit, but we're quite sure that we will not just survive, but thrive, despite, or maybe because of the earthquake that makes sure that all the different sectors in Taiwan are here to help one another out in case of disasters. So the Jade Mountain, representing kind of the pinnacle of plurality, collaboration across diversity, grows a couple of centimeters every year because of this bumping into each other. So I think uh, for me, the Taiwanese identity uh, is formed in a transcultural way. So the constant bumping into each other, both ideological and geological, uh, made sure that whichever culture, whichever ideology you hold in Taiwan, you probably have to work in a pro-social manner with every other religion or faith or culture or ideology uh, in a way that, uh, again, moves skyward toward um, common rough consensus and the common innovations delivered uh, based on those rough consensus. So whereas many um, Western established democracies uh, see, for example, uh, privacy and human rights uh, and public health uh, as a zero-sum thing that you have to put a dial somewhere. Uh, during the pandemic, we say, no, why, why not take both? Uh, we, we can make contact tracing work without sacrificing any privacy. We can make sure that our value goes down even without any top-down or lockdown actions. Uh, and so to me, the Taiwanese identity is this belief that whatever the incoming threats, the incoming uh, challenge, emergency, disasters, and so on. The civic capacity is here so that everyone, regardless of whether they're in the private, public, or social sectors, can contribute together into innovating without leaving any sector behind. And when you say that um, in the end, richness comes from diversity or strength comes mm -hmm. from diversity and it comes from the bumping of communities, bumping mm -hmm. into each other and uh, enriching themselves as they go. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious uh, about one, one particular aspect. Before, it seems that, or and the people that I've talked to and, and know a lot about the history of Taiwan seems to say, seem to say that now um, the, the fact that there's a several how can I phrase this? No, it's okay. Figure it out. It's actually no. I, I, I'm curious about. Mm. It, it's a bit like there were several waves of people coming to Taiwan, and mm -hmm. everybody mm -hmm. identified with a particular wave. So you knew that your ancestors they came from a particular <coughs> province of China uh, 300 years ago. Then there were the people that you know were originally here, the uh, Aborigines. Then there were the so-called Wai Sheng Ren that were also. A particular way. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was in Addis Ababa, uh, Ethiopia. I think we all came from there. <laughs> yes. Some people say that, you know, yeah, like, uh -huh. of course, like it depends where you go back uh -huh. um, or until un un where you go back. So, my question is um, it seems that before people identified from this particular way or this particular region, and now 
more and more the Taiwanese society is or expresses some kind of uh, multi-layered identity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Does it yeah. make sense? Yeah, the plurality I, I, I talk about, right? Not a singularity, right? Plurality. It, exactly. And, <clears throat> and I was talking to someone who said, look, mm -hmm. I can feel Taiwanese but still be proud that I speak mm -hmm. Mandarin and of I can course. read the literature from China. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. So it's this thing that I'm also curious about. Mm -hmm. like, If you have the <clears throat> feeling that this mm -hmm. is like coming up mm -hmm. right now, this mm -hmm. feeling of... And is it new for you? Like, yeah, I can be proud that I read JavaScript or something. But, but yes, I mean... <laughs> yeah, so I, I'll, I'll phrase it this way. Okay. Mm. So nowadays in Taiwan, we've got 20 national languages, including the sign language. And the implications are vast. For example, we're now looking on uh, ways for people who only know sign language to nevertheless make and receive phone calls uh, without any uh, cost, right? So I think this uh, means that the inclusiveness is not just about diversity. It is about celebrating the strength that we've got 20 national languages. Uh, that we've got many cultures, that when we're talking about marriage equality, we don't mean, again, just this model or that model, but rather we can look at, at the Amis nation, which is a matriarchy. We can look at the Paiwan nation, which doesn't care about gender when choosing successes and so on. So there's many lineages that you can trace each and every person who identify as Taiwanese. But I think one thing in common is that we celebrate this plurality. And do you think that it's the, the coming of age of, of this particular... Because also, the, uh, I, I'm trying to make a parallel here. Mm -hmm. um, we've met with people that were very much involved in the um, uh, long road to freedom. Mm -hmm. We interviewed yesterday Chen, Chen mm -hmm. Zhu. Um, yes. we, we spent time with mm -hmm. the daughter of Nylon Chung. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's interesting for us because it also shows that there's a maturity in Taiwan that mm -hmm. accepts to look at its past. Yeah. What, what do you feel mm -hmm. about this? Do you think that, the, because it's still a very young democracy, mm -hmm. so what, what is your understanding of where in this transition to democracy Taiwan is? Do you think mm -hmm. it's already there? Do you think there's still progress to be done? Mm -hmm. What would you say about this? Okay, it's hard to phrase that as not an answer, but a, <laughs> <coughs> but a statement. Okay. Uh, you can ask. Yeah. It's, okay. it's okay. It's okay. To me, uh, I talk more about democratization than democracy okay. in Taiwan, because I believe for people my generation, democracy is not a noun; it is a verb. It's something that our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation struggled, paid huge cost, so that we enjoy the freedom of speech, the freedom to assemble today. But nowadays, of course, um, on the internet and in more authoritarian regimes, uh, in the time of pandemic and so on, there's all sorts of uh, new challenges to which democracy was seen as not necessarily the best answer in other corners of the world. But I think we feel uh, a obligation to show, especially after Hong Kong, to show uh, in this area of the world that no, democracy is actually still a very good uh, rebuttal to these overcoming those challenges. And so this idea of democratization becomes then continuous. Like you look at a new challenge and you think about how can we be even more democratic in order to resolve this together, instead of saying we have to go back to some authoritarian ways of doing things because it's an emergency. So it's quite telling, for example, that during the pandemic, our president never declared a state of emergency, never even entertained the idea of declaring a state of emergency. Everything our administration did must be subject to the legislature approval and based on existing rule of law uh, that establish the parameters, uh, for example, on habeas corpus, on uh, privacy, on personal freedom, and things like that. And that was because I think everyone here wants to prove that democracy is alive and well, and it can thrive in the face of those incoming 
challenges. So to me, democratization is a continuous thing that will probably pass on to the next generation, which will have new challenges. And hopefully they will also innovate on democracy. So be open to be humble to our next generation so they can be even more democratic than our generation, I think is one of the running thread uh, during the past few generations in Taiwan. And do you have the feeling, I have two more questions. Do you, sure, have, sure. Do you have the feeling that things, uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about where Taiwan is heading, mm -hmm. and at the same time, um, the, the threat to this model and to mm -hmm. democracy here uh, is reported everywhere in mm -hmm. the world. You know, like that's the rhetoric of Xi Jinping mm -hmm. and uh, what he said about uh, Taiwan coming back to China mm -hmm. before 2049. So, are you optimistic? about mm -hmm. where Taiwan is, is heading with this mm -hmm. threat looming uh, somewhere near in a way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Taiwan is firmly part of the democracy networks of the entire planet uh, where people think that it is actually means something to have the diversity of thought, of the freedom of thought, uh, so that when new things come, uh, in some place in the world, someone will innovate on some new ways of encountering uh, this challenge and then these innovations will spread uh, with the freedom of speech and assembly and everything implicated by that, right? So um, I think as long as we are part of this democracy network, as long as, as this pin says, Taiwan can help, <laughs> we provide <laughs> useful um, models uh, to other places around the world on how to overcome these new challenges. I don't think our democratic partners will see us going back to authoritarianism uh, through annexation. Right? So I think uh, especially this year after certain geopolitical events, uh, I think uh, there's a reinvigoration of the democratic partners, not just looking after each other, but collaborating actively with each other so that uh, we send a collective message to authoritarian regimes that it doesn't pay um, to try to annex one of us. Uh, maybe it pays more to democratize yourself. And you're also famous because, um, uh, I mean, in, in the face of this threat, um, the fact that Taiwan is not present in international uh, mm -hmm. organizations, for example, mm -hmm. Uh, you very ironically mm -hmm. uh, uh, tried to, to intervene on mm -hmm. international forums. Uh, hacked, yes. <laughs> what can you tell us about mm -hmm. this? It, how, how do you see this, this act of resistance? Can you tell us first mm -hmm. what you did for our audience and, and a little bit like um, how for you this is also uh, sort of mm -hmm. promoting a model versus the overshadowing mm -hmm. of, of, of China next door? Sure. Mm. Okay, so um, way back uh, when I first became digital minister, because I don't like jet lags and I'm conscious of the carbon footprint, uh, I don't travel that much uh, to international forums uh, via airplane. Uh, so whenever possible, I prefer to appear through telepresence, sometimes just as a tablet, but sometimes as a full-fledged telepresence robot that can walk around and meet people and say hi. Um, so it just so happens uh, that in one of the meetings that I was uh, invited, I cannot enter with my own passport because it was a uh, UN meeting, United Nations meeting at Geneva. Uh, and the UN Geneva building famously uh, checked passports. And if it's not part of a UN member, you will, uh, I'll have trouble entering. Right? So uh, I didn't fly there at all, uh, but arranged so that uh, the telepresence robot, uh, which is a double robot, uh, which doesn't need a passport, by the way, uh, just enters the venue. And when it's time for me to speak, I was just sitting here and then just speaking. And people, when they raise their hand, I just turn the robot to face them and so on. So, so it's all, all good and well. Um, except, of course, the PRC uh, delegate to the UN Geneva uh, meeting. Um, seems to have a hard time um, processing uh, all this. Uh, and so uh, he raised his hand in protest and so on. But very significantly, uh, neither the robot or the delegate from Beijing left the room. So that creates a new precedent because under certain interpretations of a certain resolution of the UN, uh, there could, uh, 
based on this Westphalian idea. There could only be one representative uh, in the room, and if they cannot uh, chase that someone else out, then they themselves must leave. Otherwise, it creates so-called double representation. Uh, but uh, what I did then become a kind of new president because it's not a representation, it's a representation <laughs> of me, right? It's literally just presenting me. <laughs> so so my, my image, I mean. So I, I guess at the end of the day, uh, they put everything on record, including the protests and everything I said uh, under my name, but it's like uh, they're watching a, a movie of me, right? Uh, which was recorded half a second ago. Uh, but anyway, so um, ever after that, uh, I participated in many UN-related meetings. Um, but I did so through telepresence. Uh, the only one, I think, during those couple years that I presented in person was in Vatican uh, for the UN uh, Sustainable Development uh, Science Network. Uh, and that's because Vatican recognizes our countries. <laughs> so I think the point I'm making here is that there are really ways to think beyond the Westphalian model of things. And uh, on the internet, for example, regardless of which jurisdiction you're in and whether they recognize Taiwan, um, if you type digitalminister.tw, you get to my uh, website, you get to my computer. And so it seems uh, quite clear that while Taiwan's international position is still being deliberated by the international community, the .tw domain name is uh, a fact that it exists and it maps consistently to my computer. Uh, and so in many international forums uh, where I couldn't appear as Digital Minister of Taiwan, I simply put my name card, which is written on my name card also, as Digital Minister .tw. Uh, and so far so good. <laughs> Nobody ever protested that I'm a domain owner of Digital Minister TW because well, it is a multi-stakeholder forum, the internet forum, and we also made sure that we didn't say anything Westphalian uh, when speaking in such uh, positions. So in a sense, I guess I hacked the, the international multilateral system, uh, so it become a little bit more post-Westphalian. And final question, do you think Taiwan can hack its way back into international mm -hmm. relations and uh, hack its way back to the UN? How? Because I understand mm -hmm. the humor behind it, mm -hmm. yet there's still a, a problem of representation for Taiwan mm -hmm. in, the, in, this, uh, in this particular institution. Mm -hmm. How do you see this? Like, Is there mm -hmm. a limit to the, to the hacking and the humor, or do you think it's actually fair and, and constructive and it's going to... I think it's very constructive. For example, when I signed uh, the Declaration for the Future of the Internet um, alongside uh, Japan, the US, and Federal from Ukraine, and so on, there's like 60 right, partners <laughs> signing this together. Uh, so it entirely sidestepped the notion of whether it is a country, a jurisdiction, a nation, a state, and so on because it is, after all, the future of the internet. Mm -hmm. So this is like 60 top-level domain names, and their are representations <laughs> uh, signing on something that is very important, is about keeping the internet plural, uh, not captured by any centralizing forces or entities, uh, and yet this entire diplomatic exchange, I mean, it's signing a declaration together, um, is happening in a way that is entirely orthogonal to the Westphalian system. And Taiwan is a full partner, not an observer or anything, uh, to this signing of the declaration. So for the, for example, summit for democracy, not of democracy, because otherwise it's like people who didn't attend wasn't democratic. A summit for democracy, <laughs> a, a, a very similar uh, approach was, uh, was given, right? So we're, again, just uh, democratic partners and so on. So I think it is really constructive because every president uh, creates the more room for the future presidents, for the other uh, jurisdictions to treat Taiwan as a full partner on something without, um, as you said, uh, referring back to any particular UN resolution. Very good. Perfect for me. Excellent. Thank you so much for your Thank time you. and your, your answers. Yes. I love that you're able also to take it with a little bit of uh, they, uh, how would I say that? Mm -hmm. The galage or a little bit of uh, like a step to the side, you know, like yeah. mm -hmm. a little bit tongue in cheek at some, time, at some mm -hmm. point. <laughs> humor over rumor. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you so much. I really appreciate your mm -hmm. your time. Um, thank you so much.